Hello, folks, and welcome back to another episode of Generation Red, where family and fandom collide to bring you the Kettle Corn of Herd at Sports podcast. We will try to be sweet, but at times we'll probably get salty. I am your host, Ken. And I am your host, Scott. Well, we've this it's list season, folks. If you listen to Husker podcasts as much as I do, you know they all come up with their lists. You've got the Super Six with the Pick Six podcast. You've got other lists, top fives, top tens, all that good stuff. We have ours tonight. It's just simply called the 10. And Scott and I both chose five people within the Husker football program whom we think will make an impact on the 2024 football season. So we're going to reveal that list to you. As you can see, those are the silhouettes down below both of our cameras uh, of the people we'll talk talk about tonight so maybe you can make some guesses as we're going through if you're in the comments please give us a guess or two or guess all 10 if you want of who those people are i think a few of them are pretty obvious uh but before we get to that fun we've got to talk about what wasn't fun and that was uh unfortunately the nebraska men's basketball team still are still the uh, Power five team that's not won an NCAA tournament game and uh, lost by about 15 points on what day was it? Friday? Yeah, Friday. See, they all run Saturday. together. And, was and, it yesterday? Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was, it was Friday. It was, yeah. Yeah, it was Friday. Um, so yeah, that sucked. I was not in town. I was out of town at a leadership retreat for church. So it was supposed to be for, <laughs> silence and solitude and not bring in any worldly distractions you know that typical stuff and of course i was distracted by a basketball game until well i didn't see any of it until after the first half uh i caught the first eight minutes or so of the second half and said nope this isn't happening tonight so then i decided to focus in on the task at hand and uh caught the score later so i don't know scott did you watch any of the game at all yeah i actually watched all of it um to a certain degree, I mean, I kind of tuned out mm -hmm. basically after the first five minutes of the second half because I was just like, okay, can they rally? Can they can they redeem themselves? Because, I, I mean, it just – after basically the first seven minutes of the game, they took uh, Kese out mm -hmm. for God only knows why, um, and it just seemed like – that gave Texas A&M's offense a little bit of juice. I don't remember what that player's name was, Williams or something. I don't I don't know how to – whatever. He just started draining threes, mm -hmm. and we just couldn't stop him. Uh, they were playing in a very aggressive defensive style, and our offense could, could not find a rhythm um, after, after basically getting down by about 10 points. So – yeah. Props to Texas A&M. They had a game plan for us, and one thing mm -hmm. that has plagued our team is that mm -hmm. as soon as something goes fundamentally wrong, it's I don't know if it's a coaching thing, I don't know if it's a mentality thing, but it just doesn't seem like they can pick themselves back up and, and play a winning basketball game. Um, even though our record has been really good this year, it's just been kind of a trend. Um with Hoiberg teams generally. Yeah. Um, now it doesn't mean that Hoiberg is a bad coach. I just think that there's a culture that is in the making right now, hopefully. Um, mm -hmm. And hopefully it's something that players down the road can, can start to break that cycle. Um, but uh, yeah, no, the, uh, yeah. <clears throat> the second half was painful. I, like I said, I kind of just tuned out and then, uh, ended up playing some video games with a buddy right after the game. So, um, yeah, yeah. it yeah. was I, what I noticed in the eight or so minutes of the game that I watched. Uh, Texas A&M had athleticism on one through five. They they were extremely athletic and quick, and they they had no problem creating going down toward the rim. You know, they drove the ball and kicked out for threes. And like you said, of course, this is the game. This is the game that AM is going to figure out how to heck to hit a three pointer because they were literally ranked in like 320th in the entire country of uh, of college basketball in three point percentage. <laughs> so of course, Friday night would be the night that they'd hit 47 percent, which is what they did. So it is it is what it is. Um, Nebraska could never get into a rhythm. The athleticism, they, they need to find 
Fred needs to find himself a, a true number five, a true center, which is not his typical game, but I think you need one, especially when you get into the tournament. And uh, he needs to find a little bit more athleticism on the wings uh, on that number two guard. I think Lawrence is great in that spot. Natural, I think Rink Mast would work great as a power forward, but he needs to find an athletic small forward, uh, somebody else that can complement that athleticism. And, hey, talk Chucky Hepburn and coming home for his final year to play point guard. That wouldn't hurt my feelings any. Nope, that would not hurt my feelings either. Um I'm just super proud of these guys being able to do what, what they did season. this year. What an absolute season projected to finish 12th in the big 10. And we finished third. Like that's, you can't ask for much more than that. It yeah. is just still disappointing that we just can't have nice things as a Husker fan base. <laughs> um, but on the flip side, the mm -hmm. women mm -hmm. did an, did a pretty good job. They won their first tournament game against Texas A&M. Cause I texted you this. I was like, it is a bad <laughs> omen if we lose to Texas A&M on both sides of the tournament, um, yeah. which we didn't, we went one and one, which is like, okay, I don't have yeah. to put my tinfoil hat on and start, you know, <laughs> little, like, I don't know, like smoke rituals with some sage yeah. or some, something like, cool. I'm, I, I, it's like, I don't think I'm a superstitious person until I'm confronted with superstition, you know, <laughs> then I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> maybe I'm a little bit, maybe I'm a little bit superstitious, but yeah, it was, it was, um, well, you know, with all the stuff that happened, of course, uh, with the person who shall not be named, who is now at Texas A&M, by the way, uh, regarding our new athletic director, I just listened to Saturday's, uh, episode of Hail Varsity. I don't know if you've heard it yet, no, but they were talking to Gary Sharp. And they and Elijah toward the end of the interview, right toward the end of the show, said, "Can you confirm, Gary, whether or not um, Troy Dannon was on the 15th hole of a golf course with a couple of Washington boosters when he got a call from Nebraska?" And Gary said, "Yes, I can confirm. That's what was going on on Tuesday. He gets a call, and then he leaves the course never to return." <laughs> so, so how legendary is that story that we hired our next athletic director off a golf course while talking to a couple of money dudes at the place he was working? So, um, but That's yeah, a man who like, wanted to make change. Yes, it is, and you know his resume speaks to what he can do. He was great at UNI. He was great at Tulane. Got them some great facilities built. Uh, turned in a, turned in a pretty cool football program with badass uniforms. I think their uniforms are cool. Um, and then, of course, he was only at Washington for five months. So all he basically had to do was hire a replacement for Kalen DeBoer, which isn't an easy job. Uh, I think he might have picked a pretty good guy. Hopefully that guy can stick around and do something up there. But here he is. He's from Iowa. So here's hoping that that Iowa curse, like with the guy who shall not be named, doesn't end up sending this guy down the road for something better either or something perceived to be better. But uh, anyway... Yes, we wanted to we wanted to talk about all that in uh, last week ish, whenever it was. Um, but we decided mm -hmm. not to. Our lives. Dad was traveling across the country, and yeah. then when they got back, there is some travel lot uh, travel lag that kind of comes in play with that. And by then, the whole world had already talked about it, and yeah. uh, and so yeah, we just we'll just kind of leave that the way it is. Um, we're just kind of excited about potential changes here in the culture in the future, but also very, 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 very skeptical of the uh, powers that be. We're going to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, they moved quickly. That's the interesting thing is by Wednesday of the following week, you know, seven days later, we have an AD in place. And then an hour later, we have a pre university president in place. So um, that tells me that the issue really was between the regents and, and the guy who won't be named that, the, those they just couldn't see eye to eye on where they needed to go forward or maybe the board of regents was just waiting trev out they didn't think he was doing a good enough job and they wanted him to get so frustrated that he'd leave instead of having to fire him and throw away extra money so who knows i don't know the details behind it i don't think i ever really want to know i'm not going to look at trev as a traitor i'm not going to look at the board of regents as completely inept i'm just going to look at it as uh both sides had issues with each other and they couldn't figure it out and so one of them decided until one of them decided to move on and that works for me saves me an ulcer right i suppose <laughs> so, anyway 
why don't we get to the topic we want to talk about tonight, which is the 10, our list of 10 people in the uh, Husker football program that we believe are going to make an impact in 2024. Now, we have graded these guys on kind of a tier. Who will make the biggest impact on the season or the most impact on the season? Who will make good impact on the season and those who will make a little less impact? But the impact, regardless, will be positive. We'll just kind of look at where we think these guys are going to fall on those three tiers. Now, we're probably most likely, just like everything else we make a list for, we're probably going to be wrong, but we don't care because it's fun. So (laughs) here we go. Number one, we'll start with your selection there, Scott. And why don't you go ahead and talk about that? So we got Donovan Riola, our offensive line coach. And I said this near the end of last season and then in the off season, and I will continue to say Mm -hmm. that I think he is probably one of the more underrated coaches that we have in the sense that we didn't really get a fair shake of our offensive line last year simply because of the ineptitude in our quarterback room. Mm -hmm. I think our offensive line took a huge step forward, although the stat lines might not say it, and I'm going to say the forbidden thing, the thing that makes everybody get all and weird. The eye test, the eye test of what our offensive line looked like in 2023 versus 2022, there was a jump, okay? And Mm -hmm. I'm very curious to see this year Mm -hmm. what kind of jump they can make again. I think I'm, I would put my, I'd put money down and say that our offensive line makes a huge notable difference, um, noticeable difference. And it's because of this guy. It's because of this guy, Donovan Mm -hmm. Riola. I think that he is exactly what Matt Rule wants. There's a reason why he kept him around. And spoiler, folks, it's not because of his nephew. Um, (laughs) I think it's because he kept, I think he kept him around because his philosophy was just, it was, it was exactly what Matt Rule wanted in a guy. And so, I am very, very curious to see what kind of impact he makes, but more so, I think he just does. I think he does make an impact. Is it going to be a huge one? Uh, I'd argue yes. Some people would argue, I don't know, I don't know. It's still still up in the air. But I would put money that there's going to be people saying near the end of our season when we've got a decent quarterback running around doing some decent things, and we've got an offensive line that's showing some more dominance that we haven't seen in the better half of the last decade. Um, and there's going to be people talking about, is Donnie going to get hired away? Is he going to get taken? Is he going to go somewhere else? That would be what I'd bet money on. I think he makes a, I think he makes a fairly good impact. I'd say good impact, but since he's my pick, I picked him. So I'm going to say most impact I'd put, I'd put money on most, but I think no matter what, he makes a good impact on our team going into the 2024 season. What do you think? You have yourself muted, I believe. My bad. My bad. I had myself muted. Oops. Uh, when you just look at those three stats listed there on the screen, and I know a lot of that was because Harburg was able to break some big runs. He had some big runs and big pass plays and whatnot in some games, but uh, you know what? I'll take take those numbers any day over what we'd experienced under the uh, Whipple regime, which was Chuck and Duck. Uh, this seemed like there was a concerted effort to to get the running game jump started, and I think this is the guy that's really going to help um, do that. And you know, he's going to be motivated. He's got to protect his nephew, <laughs> so I think the pass pro, I think the pass pro is going to get better too. Um, but yeah, when you're when you come up to ninth in the country nationally in 40 plus yard runs, you're doing something right. And second in the Big Ten and 50 plus yard plays, that's both run and pass. So and second in the Big Ten in rushing. So and then we've probably got even more explosive athletes on this team coming into this season. If we can keep a running back that's who who's really good, healthy, somebody like Dowdell coming in from Oregon, or if we can get Irvin to the point where he can not get hurt. Uh, Ramir, I mean, there's just there's playmakers everywhere on this offense, and it starts up front. And I think Umfret markedly got better last year, for sure. And I think it makes another jump. And you know what? Rule likes him. Rule liked him. Rule liked Ben Hart. Ben Hart played so much better last season. Looks like he's going to 
have a good shot at the NFL coming up after this year if he stays healthy and improves again. Rule knows talent. He knows it in coaches. He knows it in players. And I think I'm going to trust his judgment on this too. So I'm right there with you. I think it's uh, – I'm not going to say most impact, but I'm going to say good impact. I think he's going to protect his nephew fairly well if his nephew will, will trust him too and not try to make the, too many things happen on his own. Uh, so, yeah, it'll, he'll make a good impact for sure. So moving on to our next slide. This is my number – first guy that I want to talk about, and that's the leading tackler from last year. And that would be Isaac Gifford, um, 86 tackles. He led the team, six and a half tackles for loss. He had eight pass breakups, which was second on the team, one interception and was honorable mention, all Big Ten player. I loved watching him play. He reminded me a lot of Jojo Doman in -hmm. that nickel spot because it seemed like when he figured out what the play was, he was there and he was smacking people. Um, I'm pretty sure there's going to be some players from opposing teams that when it's all said and done, they're going to get to the end of their career. And if they're asked about a Nebraska player they didn't like to play against, Isaac Gifford's going to be one of the first names that pop into their into their mouth. So that's my guy. I, I just think he's only going to get better. If he stays healthy, he's only going to get better. I think um, Dvorak, between Dvorak and Cooper, those guys are so good at getting him to fit in that tweener spot between a linebacker and a safety. Um, yeah, I can't wait to see what Isaac Gifford does. And for me, I think he will make the most impact. You know what? I'm I'm not going to hem haw around. I don't really have anybody on my list that I think makes less impact. I think most of them are going to be really good or, or they're going to make the most impact in their particular uh, field of expertise. So uh, most impact with with Isaac for me. What do you think? He is like the archetype of a Tony White uh, identity of a defense. Like he mm-hmm. likes there to not be a huge difference between the trenches all the way back to the cornerbacks. He likes a seamless transition of mm-hmm. skill sets between the guys. There's not a huge jump, a huge archetype jump. And that nickel position is the bread and butter of a Tony White uh, right. Tony White defense. Um, and I think Isaac Gifford fills that archetype perfectly. Um, he is just tenacious. He's got he's got that football IQ and that just game sense, that the the intan- the intangibles, the the type mm-hmm. of like instinct that he just does and doesn't think about it and you can see it on his and his gameplay on the field it doesn't look like he thinks too much he just relies on his instincts and he's just allowed to play the game of football and that's exactly what tony white wants in a defensive uh it uh, throughout his entire defense and i think isaac fulfills that role perfectly um i think he does have one of the most impactful position or he has one of the most impactful uh uh roles across our entire 2024 season um it, it's gonna it's gonna rest on his shoulders because i think he's gonna he's gonna make or break a lot of a lot of plays he's gonna make a lot he's gonna make a lot of plays and we're gonna kind of look back at the season and go damn if he wasn't there at that one moment if he wasn't there at that other moment what did what did what does that season look like? Like what, uh, sure. what was, what is the player's name? I'm, I'm totally blanking on it right now. It was uh 2014 uh, defense specifically. I think it was 2014 or maybe it was a few years before when Melvin Gordon popped off on us and went like for 400. It might've uh, been his brother. Was it Luke? Or I no, think it no. was Luke. Or was or it was, Nathan Gary? Oh, it was Nate Gary. It was Nate Gary. Yeah. Same Nate type Gary, kind of yeah. kind of like that. Where when you look back at Nate Gary's impact on our defense, he was always there for every mm-hmm. highlight. He was there either helping a tackle or being the first person there on on the tackle. So I think Isaac has that kind of impact this year. He's just always there, which is exactly what you want out of a nickel player. Yeah. But it, I'll be damned if you don't do your job. So uh, do your mm-hmm. job. I think he has the most impact. 
you know, I, I listened to um, Husker Online one day. They interviewed Tony White. And the first thing he said when they asked him how he was doing, he said, I just got out of a third down meeting where we went back through film of how my defense performed on third down, and I'm a little pissed off. <laughs> he said, so beware. And they kind of laughed it off a little bit. But he was not happy. He was not happy with, especially in the lo- games that we lost. I looked at some stats. Big Red Junkies had posted them up there. They're great podcasts, by the way, folks, if you want to check them out. Um, they posted up some interesting stats in the losing efforts versus the winning efforts, the difference between third down percentage on offense and third down percentage on defense. And it was flip-flopped. We were terrible on third down on offense and terrible on third down on defense when we lost, and the opposite was true when we won. Fix that issue, and I think Isaac makes a big, big difference in that area. That's why I have him under the most impact. So your next guy, go on ahead. So I've got Tristan Elvano, the guy who broke our hearts and won our hearts (laughs) at the same time last year. I'd say our hearts were more broken by him. Um, But what do you expect from a freshman? I mean, yes, he has the potential. I think there were some things that impacted him mentally early on in the season, some things that would have boosted his confidence that would have paid dividends throughout the rest Mm -hmm. of the year. If we can figure out how to get this guy started with some good rapport and a really positive impact early on in the season, I think he is going to pay dividends for the rest of the season. Um, He's just got raw talent. Now what he, now what he needs is just a, a mentality of steel because that's really what you do as a place kicker and a punter and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You have to have nerves of steel And you have to have an impenetrable focus, which I don't get how they do it. My heart races when I'm just thinking about talking to my boss about something. (laughs) I think I'm going to get fired. And uh, and these guys have to sit in front of crowds of tens of thousands of people and have to have just a fine tuned mechanic. They have one job (laughs) and that's to kick the damn ball, which some people (laughs) think is super simple. That's not simple at all. That's a very yeah. difficult task. And so I, I I can't help but think that our our season really does kind of rely on what kind of jump can Elvano make in the place kicking uh in the mm-hmm. place kicking game. Um I I'd like to think that he has most impact, but Ultimately, I think our bugaboos really do rely more on our offensive proficiency and then our defense being able to maintain consistency. Mm -hmm. So do I think he has the most impact? No, which is hard to say because I feel like in in years past, our biggest thorn in our side has been our special teams. But I really think that what our coaching staff has got going on on all three phases of, of the football game the weight on this guy's shoulder is going to be less going into this year. I truly believe that. So I'd say he has a good impact. And I just hope, I just hope that he, like I said, I just hope that he can start off the season right and he can carry that through for the rest of the season. So I'd say he has a good impact. Well, I'm with you. I'm, I'm in the good impact train as well. I think um, he's got the leg. 55 yarder and that was not an easy kick um he's 9 and 15 so he didn't have too many opportunities to miss only 15 on the year so um i'm not sure why he only attempted 15 i'm pretty sure he was in field goal range a few times and we ended up going for it on fourth down because maybe the coaches didn't have confidence i hope he earns some confidence this year especially since i think there's a walk-on uh, recruited from somewhere here in the state who's also got a cannon for a leg who's coming in to compete with him. So he's going to get some competition at the spot. Um, yeah, I think he makes good impact, though. I think he goes better than 9 for 15. I'd say he makes 15 kicks out of 20 this year, so that's a little bit better. So he makes a good impact, 75%. gets a job done. Yeah. I'd say I'd say he probably goes 16 out of 20. 20 for or 60 yeah 16 for 20 um yeah so just one, one more one more and that's one the more, difference one between us, hey, uh, you've talked, you us talked me into it i'm going 16 for 22 do i hear 17 do i hear oh sorry anybody in the right. comments think he goes 
17 and gets a, a crisp 80 percent proficiency or do you think uh sound off in the comments too if you think maybe somebody actually beats him out oh and he doesn't actually get the starting job he's got a big leg though he should be our kickoff guy for sure um so ready to move on to the next one yep what do you got Alrighty. here is to me i wanted to put him higher on the list but there's another guy I think that's uh, that's more important, but for me, this guy right here, Rob Dvorak, of the coaches on that defense, he has the hardest job going into 2023. See that right there on the graphic: Reimer, Heinrich, Bullock, Wright, and Uman Mielen combined for 213 tackles, 20 and a half tackles for loss, and 10 sacks. A lot of those came from Reimer and Heinrich when it comes to the tackles. Uh, so that was the heart and soul of this defense was was Reimer and Henrik. So he's got to get, you know, his Bullock's coming back. He got Wright coming back. Uman Mielin's going to be a sophomore. He's uber talented. Who else is going to fit into that inside linebacker role? Is Stefan Thompson, who came in from Syracuse, is he going to play a big role? Dvorak has, I think, the toughest job, replacing Reimer and Henrik. And I think he does it. And I think he does it well. I think you're going to have more athleticism on the field uh, a little bit more speed so for me i think rob dvorak makes the most impact especially on that defense going into 2024 and if we lose tony white at the end of the year there were whispers that if white would have taken the ucla job or gone somewhere else that dvorak could have been the inside man that was going to get elevated to that defensive coordinator position because he's just so stinking smart he's so good he's one of the smartest players rule said he ever coached when he was at Temple. Uh, so I'd like to see these numbers go up a little bit. I'd like to see his inside linebackers, the uh, six or seven guys that he's probably going to play, combine for a few more tackles, maybe more tackles for loss, especially on third down and a few more sacks. And I think they will. So I'm going to say he has most impact. What say you? I agree. I think he has most impact simply because the – level of proficiency that we saw from 2022 going into 2023 in the linebackers position group specifically was astounding that mm -hmm. that group was rock solid yeah there wasn't anything that was phasing them last year as far as i could tell yeah mm -hmm. there were some games where we got our asses kind of beat a bit but <laughs> i i don't know i don't think that was on the linebackers for any reason mm -hmm. uh I think, yes, I think he's one of those coaches that just has the it factor. Mm -hmm. He's just, he can communicate with anybody. He commands the respect of his group and his group works insanely hard, not only for him, but he gives them the ability to work hard for themselves. I think that's just his personality. He elevates people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think he does. I think he has the most impact. And I think that he's got one of those infectious coaching styles where all of the other pitches and groups also like to eavesdrop on whatever it is that he's coaching about because he just has that football IQ, that, that coaching IQ that other players want to uh, grasp onto. So I think he has probably the most impact across our, uh, our defense as a whole. You know, I, I think I think I should have just let you take this one because you said it far better than I did, and I I completely agree. Um, infectious coaching style. He just he's just one of those guys that guys gravitate toward. Just like Rule, he's kind of got that Rule personality that guys just gravitate toward him and want to play their butts off for him. I think this whole staff really kind of has that, which is what I really appreciate. Um, so moving on, the next guy is Malachi Coleman. So he didn't necessarily have any stat lines from last year or anything like that, but what he did have, I will once again do the, uh, do the forbidden thing. And I will say that his eye test as a freshman was mm -hmm. substantial. I think he's got raw talent that just needs refinement. He needs to just get a little bit bigger and he just needs to be able to have the playbook a little bit more uh, mm -hmm. down to a science. And I think that we see him come into his sophomore year with a lot more of a role, especially with a pass pro that we're going to kind of get thrown into that uh, quarterback's position that, I mean, we can sit here and, and debate all day who is going to be passing the ball to him, but I think we can all pretty much agree that we all know who that's going to be. 
And I think that Malachi is going to be elevated to a level that is going to be raising some eyebrows across the Big Ten. He's going to be talked about quite a bit. Um, and I really think that he has kind of, uh, I don't want to call it a breakout year, but he starts to to show himself um, to, to a degree that we can start to see, okay, this dude's ceiling is very, very high. And I think his ceiling is very, very high. Um, I think he has a good impact. I don't think he has most impact. I think there's a very good possibility that our wide receiver room is uh, no, no, okay. I think our wide receiver room is very unpredictable. Who is going to be the guy who stands out the most? Is it going to be IGC? Is it going to be Coleman? Is it going to be some of the other guys? We've just got so many question marks on our wide receiver room because of the ineptitude on our quarterbacks last year. It's really hard to see who is going to step up and be that guy who's consistently open. Because we saw dudes open left and right all of last mm -hmm. year, but we just didn't have a quarterback that could get the ball to him. I think mm -hmm. Malachi is one of those guys that's going to be open a lot, and there's going to be balls past his way a lot. I wouldn't be surprised if he if he ends the season with around, I mean, at minimum, I think he ends up with 500 yards of receiving. Um, I'd say he, he ends up probably more in like the 600, 700 range. Mm -hmm. Um, that's just my opinion. Um, uh, but that's a good impact to me. So I don't want to say most impact if he was getting a thousand yards. Yeah. I'd say most impact, but <laughs> I think he has yeah. a good impact. And it's just one of those stories that just, just it, it, it personifies the Nebraska brand. Look yeah. at this guy, local kid insane talent could have gone anywhere in the country and he chose to stay home. He mm -hmm. is the cornerstone type of player that is going to inspire more kids from the Nebraska in the Nebraska region, Nebraska state state of Nebraska and the regional area that Nebraska is a place to go play football. If you want to play at a high level. So I think mm -hmm. he makes a good impact this year as a, as a sophomore. I'm right there with you. Uh, Malachi is one of those kids, uh, just like you so perfectly put it, is just a kid you want to root for um, just because of who he is, what he's using his NIL money for uh, to benefit foster homes in in Nebraska. You just, you just want this guy to succeed. And even if he doesn't succeed like we hope he does on the football field or bring us any to any kind of championship-level performance – you know he's going to succeed off of it. You know that people's lives are going to be better because he exists in this world. He's just one of those kind of guys you have to root for. I think he makes a good impact as well, uh, not just for what he does on the field, but for what he does off of it. I think he's great for that wide receiver room. Um, I think he's a uniter. He's one of those guys that's going to work hard, try to outwork everybody. He's going to make those two transfer guys work their tails off to get on the field uh, this year, which is only good for the entirety of the team. I think he's going to stretch Garrett McGuire's ability to coach um, because he is a little bit of a raw talent. A lot of speed. He's got to work on his route running. But I think it that does get better. I think the route running gets better. I think he gets open a little bit more often because I think we're going to have a better running game that's going to allow the play action to work a little bit. And you know what? Good God almighty, Dylan sure looks smooth throwing the football. So... Uh, I like that connection possibility, Dylan and Malachi. I think it's going to be, it's going to be pretty crispy. fun to watch. So yeah, crispy. That's a good way to put it. It's a good way to put it. Uh, anything else you want to say about that? Or you want to nope, move on? Nope. I, I'm yeah. glad you brought up the fact of his, his philanthropy because he is an outstanding just citizen, just, mm -hmm. <laughs> just, an, just a good dude. And you always want to cheer for the good dudes. Um, I mean, he, mm -hmm. He he personifies like the Brooke Barringer type of of mm -hmm. person. Like he's just he's just that good. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's important mm -hmm. to also talk about. Absolutely. Absolutely. So moving on, another couple of guys, because I'm cheating here. <laughs> I couldn't figure out how to use my software to blend the two faces together so you kind of could see a blend of them. But uh, this is my guy. Uh, that I think is going to make a most another most impact on the defense. Nash Ty Robin Maker, um, Nashy <laughs> Nashty Robin Maker. Um, they're 
they were good last year. I mean, 22 starts, 69 tackles, 12 tackles for loss. Nash had four and a half sacks. T-Rob had 11 QB8 hurries and six pass breakups, and one field goal block. And I was seeing people on Twitter going, I don't know what Ty's doing in there. He's not affecting the game. I'm like, it's right there. <laughs> it's pretty obvious right there on the screen that he did affect games that he played in for sure. I I like both of them so much. I like the fact that they complement each other. I think Nash coming in and probably playing not necessarily at 325 or 330 anymore, but staying down in that 310, 315 level is going to get him a step quicker. If I remember mm-hmm. right, um, I don't know if you've seen the latest documentary that they put out um, on YouTube, but they interviewed his parents. His dad, I thought Na- Nash was big. Holy smoke, his dad is a mountain of muscle. Um, no, I haven't seen it. It's really, really good. It's called Chasing Three. It's all about the fact that Nebraska lost five games last year by three points um, or less. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, again, that's <laughs> kind of like 2021 all over again, but with somebody at, at coach who's actually an adult. But, um, yeah, Nash, I think his mom and dad said something to the effect of, or maybe it was his position coach said he was pissed at himself in the Iowa game because he hit Deacon Hill one time just as he threw the ball, but Hill completed the pass. And he said if he was a half a step quicker, he hits him before that ball gets out. Maybe he causes a fumble. Maybe mm-hmm. he just gets a sack and they're off the field and the offense can go down and score. So those are the kind of things I'm hearing from guys like Nash and Ty. And Ty's decision to come back to play another year, he said it was because he's pissed off the way things ended against Wisconsin. That the way that oh. overtime ended, he just did not want to leave with that taste in his mouth. He wanted to come back and fix it. <laughs> so Good. look out who's ever quarterbacking at Wisconsin this next year. You're going to have a really pissed off kid from Gilbert, Arizona, coming after you every single play he's on the field. So those are my those are my guy. That's my guy on the next uh, next on the most impact. Where do you got those the Nash Ty Robin maker rated most good or less? Well, I think it's basically safe to say that our defense as a whole can be put into the category of most impactful going into next year because yeah. the the real discussion behind all of this is: Does our defense take a step forward, or do they take a step back, or do they remain the same? Obviously, Mm -hmm. we would prefer to have them at least stay the same or improve. And I think that it really does fall on our defensive line. Are they able to take a step forward Mm -hmm. or are they going to stay the same or are they going to go back? Because I I really think that, yes, like you just described, I hadn't seen that or any any description of that documentary or, or anything like that. But what you said really did ring true to me that they're a half a step away from making a Mm -hmm. massive jump on our defensive line. Can they use their handwork to a, to a better degree? Can Mm -hmm. they use their footwork to a better degree? Are they able to use manipulatives better? Because seriously, if they're able to just refine it just a little bit more and they can get that, Mm -hmm. you know, two, one, two, one hundredths of a second, or like a, you know, a, sorry, like a, like half a second to a quarter mm-hmm. of a second to half a second step quicker. That's a huge difference because that was something that was insanely frustrating about last year for me was that we were right there so many times. And when you would hit the rewind button, it was because they were getting caught up with their, with their manipulatives or they were getting caught up in their footwork or they were getting caught up with their with their hand movements or, or their, their push offs mm-hmm. or whatever. Can they refine that down to just a quarter of a second quicker? And then, yeah, then maybe you do knock fat ass Deacon Hill down a little bit quicker and then he <laughs> drops the ball or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but mm-hmm. I really do think you, you are correct. Most impact is just on our defenses as, as a whole, but that defensive line is got to take a step forward i believe mm-hmm. and that mm-hmm. makes a huge difference in those games those those three point games those mm-hmm. games where it's down to one final drive and our defense has to make a stand our defensive mm-hmm. line needs to lead lead i mean they're the trenches for a reason they're in right. the trenches for a reason it's it's a metaphor for a very specific reason is they are on the front line yep so mm-hmm. they've got they've got they've got to take a step forward and i think those two guys can can do it 
So most impact. Well definitely. Put. Well put. So moving on to our next player, we have Thomas Fedoni, the man who inspires so much controversy just in the Twitterverse for no damn reason all the time. It's just there's people who want who want to be in the he's a bust camp. And then there's people like me who live in reality and have a set of eyeballs who can say that he just needs a quarterback that can get the ball to him. Yeah. Because I I can't begin to express like if there's any player from last year that you could look back at a film and say, that man is open, throw him the damn ball. <laughs> they did yeah. a few times, but they would throw it six feet over his head, which is insanely hard to do considering he's like 12 foot 15. Right. Um, but <laughs> This man, he has the potential to just immediately jump himself into a third round, second round, even first round draft pick. Yes, yeah. he's got some injuries that have plagued him, but, but he seemed to have recovered in su mm -hmm. to such a degree. I, I don't know. Does He has some volatility, yes. But I think that what ne what's going to elevate him is a competent quarterback room. Mm -hmm. And dude can block. But that man can get open, and he is deceivingly mm -hmm. fast, very, very quick. Um, so I really think that he would have the most impact next year out of out of our wide receiver, you know, tight end room. I think he's the person that you could chalk around and say this guy has the highest potential to have the most impact on our offense, just bar none. Just. Okay. That's my that's my bold take. I don't know why it's so bold. Like seriously, just look at the man. He he has the potential. He yeah. just needs he just needs a man who can get him the ball. Um so I think he has the most impact. That's my uh that's my bold prediction. I hate that I have to say bold, but it right. is what it is. Stats don't lie. He's he hasn't been stati statistically significant thus far, but I think mm -hmm. he can be. Sure, sure. You know what? I that was a very well reasoned argument for for most impact. For me, I wonder what's I, the name is completely slipping me. Who's the kid that we recruited out of Ainsworth, the number one player in Nebraska in two thousand twenty four? He's a tight end, extremely fast, can split out, can play wide receiver. Let me pull Carter, it up. Carter I haven't Nelson. been Carter Nelson. Carter Nelson, that's the one. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you see, do you foresee Fedoni being so good in spring camp and into fall camp that Carter Nelson doesn't get on the field? I'm not sure I do. Uh, but I do see twin tight end sets with both of those guys where both of them could either block, knock you on your tail, because Carter's a really good blocker as well, or both of them be out in the pattern and or <laughs> And then you've got Malachi on one side of one of them, or you've got, you know, Jalen Lloyd or one of the two. I mean, we could have four really big wide receivers on the field at any given time. And Malachi might not even be one of them out there. That's the beauty of what we've got on offense now. But I think Thomas Fedoni, I'm with you. I think he makes an impact. I'm just not sure most impact is where he's going to be at this point. I've got him making good impact. I've got him probably catching at least... 30 to 40 balls this year for twice the yardage he did last year and maybe six touchdowns. I see him making that kind of impact, but I have a feeling there may be somebody else on that opposite side of the line of the scrimmage that might have a little bit more impact in Carter Nelson. Who knows? I might be completely wrong. Um, but I think our tight ends coach is our offensive coordinator and he's known for being really, really good with tight ends. So there you go. That's kind of my thoughts on it. And I don't know if you have any others at all. No, I think you made a good I think you made a good point about Carter Nelson and what kind of impact he can make in that room altogether. Um, I guess my the only thing I would say to add on to that is just talent elevates talent. And so yep. Carter Nelson being just a pure raw talent, I think pushes Fedoni to that a level that Fedoni needs to be pushed to. And so I think you actually make a good uh like a good point for me in the sense that it's going to push Thomas Fedoni to a, He's to a better. level that he hasn't been pushed to yet. Cause I don't think James yep. Carney put, put much of mm -hmm. a, put much of a challenge on him. That's why he ended up leaving. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just, I talent elevates talent. So yep. 
I, I think that Carter Nelson might actually bode bode well for Thomas Fedoni. But in the stats game, yeah, I have a feeling if Carter Nelson is pushing Thomas Fedoni, that means that Carter Nelson is seeing the field. And so sure. there's going to be a, a, a more even distribution of roles. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, great points. And I think this next guy is going to be the key to – unlocking what guys like Fedoni, Carter Nelson, Isaiah Nayor, all these new guys that are coming into the program, along with guys like Malachi and Jalen and Demetrius Hill, or uh, is it Demetrius Hill? There's is a kid Bell? from Tennessee. Demetrius or Bell. Bell. Yeah. That, yeah. that a lot of people are saying, watch this kid. He's not here now, but when he gets here, he could, he could be our kick returner, maybe even our punt return special. He's just that kind of an electric athlete. But this next guy, which for me, I went back and forth as to whether this was going to be the last guy I talked about or put in this spot, but I decided to put him here, and that would be our new quarterback coach and co-OC, Glenn Thomas. Um, I think he's going to have <laughs> – I, I hate to be a broken record. I think I had Malachi at good impact and maybe one of your other guys at good impact, but every one of my guys I think I've said at most, and I think Glenn Thomas is going to have the most impact of anybody – on our entirety of our offense, just because he's a competent QB coach and he's probably got one of the best quarterbacks to come out of high school in a long time to coach. Um, 10 years of college football experience as a coordinator. He was the QB coach and co-OC at Baylor when they were really good in 2017 through 2019 when Rule was there. Won a, um, what they do, they almost won the Big 12 Conference uh, 11 games, 10 games one year, 11 games the next. He was the OC at Temple with Rule in 25, 2015 and 16 was the first time they had back-to-back 10-win -back seasons ever. They were the AAC champs the year before Frost won it at USCF with a 413.6 yards per game average and 32.4 points per game. To me, those numbers just jump out at me. The 413.6 and the 32.4, I know that was in the AAC. I understand the Big Ten is a different animal. But, man, if we can just improve on what we did last year by six points a game, you know, go from 19 points a game or 18.5 points a game to 24. God, that's going to win us at least three more, you know, if not four. So uh, those numbers jump out. I think he has the most impact, especially on guys like Fedoni, Carter Nelson, all these other talented players that we have coming in because he's going to run that passing game probably to – Pretty good efficiency, I would think. So, and he's tutoring tutelage. She'll be given tutoring to uh, a quarterback that we have not seen the likes of at Nebraska, at least on a talent level, since uh, the last guy that wore number fifteen, who was really good, last name of Frazier. So, different quarterbacks, similar talent level in my mind. So, what mm -hmm. do you think? This one is probably the hardest one for me to judge because he's. One of only two out of this list of 10 most impactful people on the season. One of only two that we have seen nothing from. Like right. he's, he's arriving. He's in a, a new arrival to the program. And our quarterback room is in DEFCON 5 or DEFCON 4 or whatever. Like we are, we are just, we need help in our quarterback room we've needed it since the early 2000s post crouch mm -hmm. like we just haven't yeah. aside from i mean okay so we've had some decent quarterbacks i don't want to discount taylor just martinez yeah. or yeah. or you know kellogg or armstrong or stuff we've had some we've had some decent quarterbacks but what we really need is elite quarterback play. That's what's going to put Nebraska back on the map. We need elite quarterback. We need an identity in our quarterback room. And is Glenn Thomas going to be the guy to do that? I really don't know. I think he's got a good potential for it. But I would say no matter what, you have to put him as most impactful um, because – He's going to have an impact, whether good or bad. He's going to leave an impression. If he does, if he, if our if our quarterback room improves, that is the most impact he could possibly do. Mm -hmm. If our quarterback room does absolutely nothing, that has the most impact on our offense because we <laughs> we we suck still. So yeah. 
<laughs> so yes, I think no matter which way, no matter which way you look at this guy, you have to say he has the most impact because our quarterback room is in SOS mode. We need some serious help in our quarterback room. Do I think Glenn mm -hmm. Thomas is the guy? I have a sneaking suspicion to say yes. Um, but I, I guess we won't know until we see it. Um, sure. but yeah, when it comes to coaching, like it's easy to look at a player and go, okay, yeah, he hasn't proved himself yet, but look at this, look at that, look at that. You kind of have some tangibles and you could get, you could say this guy, no matter who his coach is or whatever, he can either be a good, a good addition or a bad addition. You can generally mm -hmm. make that judgment when it comes to coaches. That is a game of personality, philosophy. Uh, I don't mean literal politics, but the politics of football. Oh, sure. um, so what is he going to bring to the table to this quarterback room? I don't, I really don't know. Um, mm -hmm. But no matter what, he is going to make the most impact. So let's hope, let's, let's pray to the football gods that it is good, most impact. Sure. I, you know what? I, I can't, I can't argue with that. I, I think Charlie Brewer under his wing at Baylor only got better each season. Same with the Temple quarterback. So I'm going on track record. Like I said, he's just coming in. We don't know what he's going to bring necessarily, but you got to admit what he's going to have to work with here as far as between probably Kalen and Dylan is probably equal talent, if not greater than what he worked with for sure at Temple and definitely at Baylor. So I'm going to go with that, that the, what he has to work with, the palette that he gets to paint with is probably going to show off. As you said, though, either most impact in the wrong way or most impact in a good way. So, um, yes, there we go. All right. Moving on to uh, to your last guy. And I love this pick. I absolutely love this pick. So knock knock us off. Let us know. What do you think? Why? Why is Tony White kind of at the tip top of of who you wanted to talk about tonight? Because we're going to find out. I, I do I think personally he is the real deal? Yes. Mm -hmm. But do I still have that creeping voice in the back of my head that's saying it's too good to be true? Nebraska is mm -hmm. not allowed to have nice things. And Tony White so far has been a nice thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so I've got him at the top of my list because my personal opinion is that I think he's a top 10 defensive coordinator in the entire country. Mm -hmm. um, can we see that? Can we, I, I mm -hmm. hope so. I think so. I think we take a, I think we take a step forward on our defense. That's, that's what I would put money on. And it, and it falls on the shoulders of this man right here. Mm -hmm. um, he is a cornerstone of this program. Um, the fact that he decided to stay when, literally every college would have forked out enough cash to entice him to leave because mm -hmm. of what he did at Syracuse and then immediately went to a downtrodden Nebraska and elevated their defense to a statistical level that they haven't seen in, in well over a decade. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. He's going to make probably the most impact out of this entire year. Um, so yeah, I mean, just, there's no way to not look at him and go, this dude is gonna is gonna make the most impact. It's it's just it, it seems self evident to me. So, uh, what do you think? I'm right there with you. Most impact, absolutely. And uh, before I add my thoughts to yours, I just want to let everybody know. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate it. If you want to give us a like on YouTube, if you're watching us on YouTube, we'd really appreciate it. Uh, we've got 29 viewers on Twitter. And that's wow. awesome. That's the most we've ever had on Twitter. And if you guys are commenting in the comments section on Twitter, we really appreciate that. Unfortunately, for some reason, StreamYard and Twitter don't like to talk to one another when it comes to live chat, at least not on my end at this point. So my apologies if you've been adding your thoughts. We'd love to hear them. So make sure you send them to genredpod at gmail.com or just switch over to our YouTube channel and throw your comments down in the live chat on there. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, anyway, as far as Tony White is concerned, um, yeah, the the stats from 2023 um, need to improve a little, you know, especially on third down percentage. 
uh, would be nice um, to keep that rush defense where it's at, keep that total defense about where it's at, if not improved, would be would be awesome. And I think he will make most impact, especially on the coaching staff on the defense, simply because I do think that rush defense gets better. I think that total defense gets better. I think 32 sacks will probably improve by five or six. It'd be really cool to get up to 40 again. You know, like we used to do almost every day, every year in the 90s when we had badasses all the way up and down those uh, defensive lines. And then get those tackles for loss up a little more, especially on third down. That would be really, really nice. So, yeah, most impact for me on Tony White. Uh, seems like a great guy. And he'll probably make the most impact in the offseason because I have a feeling it's one and done. I have a feeling there's going to be a job that's going to open up that he's not going to be able to resist. And, yeah. uh, and he'll move on, and then we'll know who's going to take his spot. My bet, if I were placing money, it'd be on Rob Deforacek or uh, Terrence Knighton, because you can't argue with what Knighton has done on that defensive line. And I truly was torn between picking Terrence Knighton and picking um, Rob Deforacek earlier for one of the coaches, so... Um, but yeah, I like I like all your arguments uh, regarding Tony White. I think you're dead on on that. So let's move on to our last guy. And I, and I think the silhouette, folks, I probably don't even need to light it up. You know who it is. We know who it is. It is the one, the only, the greatest quarterback recruit Nebraska has seen since 1992 when Frazier signed his letter of intent, in my opinion, when it comes to talent level. We have not recruited anybody better than this. When it comes to stats, 8,500 yards passing through a high school career at three different high schools. Now, a lot of us have some trep trepidation of the fact that he moved around a lot, but everywhere he moved, he got better. 88 total touchdowns, 34 in his senior year, 11 interceptions over his high school career, and only one during his senior year, and he averaged 64% completion rate. To me... I have struggled with whether or not I want to go against the grain and say good impact with Dylan because he's a true freshman and because I don't know 100% absolutely for sure that he's going to be the starting quarterback in game one. Hedging my bets, yeah, he will be, but I'm just not 100% sure. So I am going to go. I know, folks, please forgive me. This is blasphemy, but I'm going to go with good impact. Because I do think he's going to struggle translating a little bit to the college game. He was probably going to throw 11 interceptions in his freshman year. That's what I'm betting on. But I also think he has the potential to throw 34 touchdowns <laughs> in his freshman year as well. So I'm going to say good impact simply based on touchdown to interception ratio. And if he proves me completely wrong, trust me, I will be the happiest fan on the planet to say I was completely wrong about this. He did make the most impact on that offense when it comes to playing on the field of play. So, um, yeah. What do you think? Am I think I uh, lunch. I think a three to one touchdown to interception ratio. If the interceptions are indeed eleven, is monumentally an improvement on our offense. Um, Good point. That. That means that he's only averaging less than an interception, just under less than an interception per game, and his impact is three touchdowns. Mm -hmm. That is something that we could desperately use. That's that's <laughs> almost, I hate to say it, knock on wood, that's almost a guarantee bowl game. Like, if right. our defense stays the same and our offense improves with 34 touchdowns to 11 interceptions under one guy, I think that mm -hmm. is the difference between us going bowling and not going bowling. Uh, I think I'm just going to just outright say, I think he has the most impact because he, no matter which way we want to look at it. I, I, I mean, do, do I, do I think Daniel Kalen could put up a good fight? Do I think the guys that we've got on our roster right now, do I think they could put up a good fight? Eh, no, <laughs> not, not really, because because if you were to just say, OK, well, you've got Kalen and you've got Riola from just a pure talent standpoint, unless for some reason Kalen just just exhibits 
raw and pure football IQ and he makes literally zero mistakes in camp and just completely blows the socks off of our, our offensive coaching staff. Mm -hmm. You just got to give the ball to Dylan Raiola. And I think you made a point that I think very, I, I see very few people talking about the value that you actually have as a quarterback when you've played at three different high schools. Yet, yes, they're probably the same systems ish, but there's probably different playbooks. There's probably different, there's different dynamics. There's, mm -hmm. you have to command the respect of your locker room three different times. And then you have to play in three different, like three different cultures. No matter mm -hmm. what, each high school you go to is going to have a different culture and a different feel to it. Good and point. he was able to, he was able to just tune all of that noise out and not take a step back, but take a step forward. That is a guy who's got an insanely high level of competence in the quarterback room. And mm -hmm. I don't think that you can look at it any other way than a guy who can just show up somewhere and make a difference. And yes, the quarterback or the, uh, the, 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 the competition going from high school to college is something that, that you can't remiss. Um, but I, I can't argue with the experts when all of the experts are saying this man can literally seamlessly transition to power five play with little to no hiccup. Like it's not every day you have football experts saying that they said that about Trevor Lawrence and they were correct. They've oh, said God, that. They ever, yeah. Yes. They've said that about multiple guys that have all panned out. Yes. They've said it about a few guys that didn't pan out like JT. What is it? JT Daniels. They said that mm -hmm. about him. And but he's like one of the only true flops in the last decade that you can look at where all the experts were just completely wrong. Um, that I don't think that's on the experts. I really think that was an individual thing for Daniels, but that's Maybe. neither here nor there. But um, I think that Raiola is one of those guys that is the paradigm shifting impact in this program. Hopefully he stays. I hope he stays. I think he will. I did, in the era of the transfer quarter and the era of the transfer portal, it's not out of the question that he shows up, makes a huge impact, and then goes and takes a six million dollar bag from somewhere else. I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I hate to be that cynical about it, but it just mm -hmm. is what it is. I can't help but like have that creep into my mind every once in a while. But no matter mm -hmm. what, twenty twenty four is his year to show up and do something. And I think he does. I think, I think he shows up and I think he, I don't think he goes and like just blows the freaking wheels off. I don't think he ends up in a, in a Heisman conversation per se, but I do think that he becomes a game manager. I think he gets his shit rocked a few times, but he bounces back and he makes sound and timely decisions more mm -hmm. often than not. And that's all we need from our quarterback room. And so for mm -hmm. that reason, I think he makes the most impact because gosh dang it, I can't stress this enough. The difference between last year being a nine win team and a five win mm -hmm. team was a game managing quarterback. Mm -hmm. That's all we needed. And so that's all we, that's all we need to demand of him. Just manage the game, bro. Just yep. relax. You've been here before. This ain't no thing. Just do your thing, man. Like that's mm -hmm. what he needs. And so that's going to make the most impact. That's going to make, that's going to elevate our team to a place that we haven't seen since the Bo Pelini era. So mm -hmm. that's the most impact that I could possibly imagine. So let's go, Dylan. Let's do it. <laughs> good, good points. All oh, absolutely. And that's our list. So that was fun. That was a great exercise. Folks, we had no idea what each one of us was going to say about our perspective guys we decided to not really talk about it beforehand we just wanted to have a conversation and i thought it was outstanding um do you have just weird question and i know you didn't i did not give you this ahead of time but yeah. off the top of your head is there an honorable mention person in the football program that you'd like to just shout out and say hey this person could have some impact too we just didn't include them on the list <laughs> I think I'd have to say, well, I would, I would say Terrence Knighton, but you, you kind of already alluded to that earlier. So I'll, I'll kind of be selfish and bite off a little bit more. And I would say Daniel Kalen because okay. QB he's going to, yeah. he's going to be the guy that 
keeps that elevation moving in an upward trajectory. Mm -hmm. uh, Dylan needs substantial competition to keep his head on right. Sure. And knowing as, as a Husker nation that if, if Dylan has to sit on the bench for a little bit for mental or physical reasons, we need to know that there's a guy who can fall into his boots and mm -hmm. be able to uh, not take a step back. Good. We need we need the Brooke Barringer to Tommy Frazier mm -hmm. or vice versa. We need that level of competition in the quarterback room. We don't need a number one like we've seen for years, man. My entire life of being a Husker fan has been we've got quarterback number one, and then there's this steep freaking cliff. Yeah. That is going to make a huge impact. So yes, I'd mm -hmm. say I'd say my honorable mention is QB two, which I think is Daniel Kalen. Yeah, yeah. You know what? That would have been. That's probably mine as well. I really don't have another one because, quite frankly, folks, when I was making out my list of five, the first list I made QB two was listed instead of Isaac Gifford. You and did text me that. I was going to go with Isaac Gifford as as a you know honorable mention, but I thought no. This guy led the team in tackles. He's going to have every bit as much impact this year as he did last year. So I went with Isaac and QB2 for me is good because you don't get through the Big Ten season as a quarterback at Nebraska and you get through it unscathed unless your name is Tanner Lee. And that's only because you've completed more passes to the other team than you did your own. So, um, <laughs> damn. <laughs> so, that was rough. <laughs> and like half of those went back for touchdowns too. So that was miserable for all of us. But uh yeah. Um QB2 would be my also be my honorable mention. Um thank you so much, folks, for watching. Real quick, just some for future show reference. Uh we're probably gonna do another stream about the middle of April where we will feature um, Ravi Lula from the Herd at Sports Network. He's also the co-host with Damon Benning of the Herd at Sports in the Morning Show. He's going to be in studio here. He wants to come to Lincoln and hang out in the studio. And uh, we'll talk to Ravi about what it's like to be the new, well, he's kind of a new uh, business account manager personnel at Herd at Sports, which is awesome. Just had a great phone call with him. And then in May, I'm sporting some of their clothing, cornlifegoods.com. It's fantastic clothes. They're so comfortable, soft. They wash up nice. They fit good. Um, they're going to be in studio as well. It's a family-run business right here in Lincoln. Uh, so go to cornlifegoods.com and check out some of their stuff. So we'll just have them in here, and we'll talk about what it's like to start a business and do one right here in Lincoln as a family. And it should be a fun episode. So that's what's going on in May. Not sure what we're doing for June yet. Not sure if we're doing necessarily anything after the spring game like we did last year. Maybe we'll do another one of our watch parties, Scott, after the spring game. I'm going to miss the spring game because I'm actually going to be at a marriage seminar in Lincoln that day. So <laughs> I'm when not going to actually. Game? Is it like out. April? April 27th. Okay. April 27th. Well, I should be able so maybe, to go to that. So maybe we'll just have to grab the YouTube broadcast of it or something and just sit and watch it and do a live stream, even though everybody's already seen it, just do a live stream and talk about what we saw and players that we think based on our impact list, how those guys showed out. That would be kind of fun. So Could be. anyway, just something to think about. Maybe we'll do that in late April, but uh, yeah, April halfway through April, we'll sit down with Ravi Lula. We'll have corn life goods in, in May. And then from then on, we're going to start ramping up for the season starting in June. So Thanks so much, everybody, for watching. We really appreciate it. Again, share the YouTube channel with, with your friends. Make sure you like and subscribe to our audio feed. You can do that at our website at genredpod.com. All the major podcast links are right there to subscribe to this show. Um, excuse me. Dinner's kicking back. Um, and then Generation Red on your favorite podcast app if you don't want to go through the through the uh, website to find out if we're set up on your favorite app. Chances are you'll find it anyway. So anyway, um, anything else? Where can folks follow you, Scott? They can't. I mean, you can follow me on Twitter, but I deleted Twitter. I actually just did like a whole purge, man. It was great. I went through all yeah. my notifications and I turned them all off for everything. <laughs> all I have is like when people want to reach out to me personally on Facebook Messenger, like mm. or text messages or calls or whatever, but I turned mm. it all off. 
because I am just, I, I don't know, man, just the whole, the whole world of, of social media is just something that I want to try and move away from. Um, so that's cool. Yeah. 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 It's, it's such mm. a, it's such a, it's such a, uh, uh, an inaccurate representation of, of groups. People. And so mm -hmm. I just want to, and I've got a baby, you know, I got a kid on the way. I want, I want my life to be focused around my child and my family and mm. not so much about the world is ending 24 seven. Um, yeah. but yeah, yeah, I mean, you can follow me on Twitter, like by all means, like it's at Scott Gen Red pod, but it's just going to be a ghost <laughs> town over there. Um, maybe when the season racks back up, maybe I turn on Twitter just for the game days and just, and just correspond with people on game days. And then it just goes back into the, the dart into the stone age for the next six. Um, <laughs> it goes back, sinks back into the recesses of the dark web. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, so maybe as the season gets closer, that's something I will do. So yes, all of you, uh, 30 viewers on, on Twitter, I do appreciate you very much. Um, but I will leave my dad to uh, to deal with all of you. So, um. yeah, and that's easy. That's <laughs> at Jen Red Pod on Twitter, and uh, that's also the same for Facebook and for YouTube. We didn't have any Facebook viewers. Usually, we have at least one. So, oh well, maybe I did a bad job promoting out on Facebook, which is something I'm really hoping that Hurt at Sports will begin to help us out with. So, thanks, Robbie, for the phone call the other day. That was a really good conversation. Um. With that, I'm Scott. He's Ken. Oh, hey, there we go. I'm Scott. He's Ken. I think I've done that before. Freaky Friday. That before. Yeah, that's right. that's right. It's blooper time. Blooper time. I'm Ken. He's Scott. <laughs> Together we're Generation Red, and we're here to chronicle Nebraska's eventual return to greatness, one podcast at a time, because there's no place like Nebraska. And Iowa's corn sucks like a perpetual state of having a full, full bladder, which is... Uh... Oh. basically basically what i feel like right now i gotta pee so bad and that's what it's got to feel like to be an iowa fan 24 7 yeah it's just got to be awful anyway thanks Terrible. again for watching scott you go pee and we will see you next time okay.